And Lord, would your Holy Spirit convict us of what you want to convict us. Let this day be a day dedicated and devoted to you. Let this day be our Sabbath day, a day of rest for us to be recharged and rejuvenated, but more importantly, for us to give you the glory and thanks for all the things you've done. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In middle school, at church, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who was a little older. He was actually a friend, my brother, my, my friend's older brother. And I was the good kid, and, and he was also a very good kid, but uh, we were talking very philosophically. And I don't know if you know any middle schoolers, but um, imagine what a philosoph- philosophical conversation is between uh, kids in middle school. Um, but actually, surprisingly, this one was kind of deep. Like, it was a, a conversation that I, I still remember because of how impactful it was on me. But he was telling me about a friend at school who was Christian, um, didn't go to our church, but it was Christian, and he was, he was telling me uh, how his friend was losing his faith, how his friend was struggling with his faith. And, and I think they were in, uh, fresh, like freshmen in, in high school, um, but his friend was really struggling with his faith. And I was asking him, like, like why? Like, what, what, I mean, what is there to struggle with? Isn't, isn't it, like, doesn't everyone go to church? And he was like, no, like, he's really struggling um, with the Ten Commandments. And I was like, well, what is he struggling with the Ten Commandments? And, um, because again, in my head, it was very simple, like, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, you know, don't do bad things, like, love God, you know, that, 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 that's, that's pretty much the Ten Commandments, right? But he was saying, no, there's a, ten, there's a commandment in there that says, honor your father and mother. And basically, his friend and um, my friend were, were having a conversation and saying, you know, what if you're smarter than your parents? And I know I, coming from the mouths of children, that seems so arrogant, right? Like um, he was saying, he was basically telling my friend, he was saying, I'm smarter than my dad. I'm smarter than my mom. They don't deserve my honor. Why would I obey them? And I remember my friend being like, yeah, I, I get it. Like this is a real faith issue for him. And I was like, man, that's just, I, I was telling him as a middle schooler, that sounds so disrespectful. That sounds so bad. Like, how can you think that you're smarter than your parents? And I remember my friend, he looked back at me and he said, Jeremy, your parents are doctors. They went to college. They went to medical school. Like, you don't, you can't say you're smarter than your parents because they clearly are smarter than you. But my friend's parents never went to college. They barely passed high school. They're not that smart. So my friend is saying, is saying that he can't respect his parents, he can't honor his parents because he feels smarter than they are. He has more education than they do. Today what we're going to be talking about is very important. Today what we're talking about is the difference between conditional love and unconditional love. Today we're going to be talking about love that is based on what the other person deserves and an unconditional love that has nothing to do with what they've done. Conditional love is what the world teaches you. Conditional love is the kind of love that you are born with. The kind of love that you inherently understand and know in your heart that when someone is good, when someone does good things, that they are deserving of your commitment, your time, effort, and energy because they are good. Unconditional love says no matter what you've done, no matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter who you've been, I'm committed to you. And I love you. Interestingly enough, in in relationships now, a lot of our love is conditional. Our attraction to one another is conditional. It is, I'm with this girl because she's so pretty. I'm with this guy because he's so employed. Like he has such a good job. We, we make things out to be that the reason why we care for someone is because of what they are able to do or what they look like or who they are. The love is so conditional and the foundation is so weak. Because what happens when that guy loses their job and they're unemployed? 
What happens when they lose respect? What happens when she's not so pretty anymore or he's not so pretty anymore? What happens, what happens when things fall apart as life does all the time? Things just break away, things just decay, things just go into chaos and things fall apart. What do you do? The world will tell you a very easy answer. Just move on. Just move on. Don't think about them anymore. Find someone better. Find something better. Things are just temporary anyways. You might as well, li- you might as well live life to the fullest because when we die, we just turn to dust. And so everything is just meaningless. And so just get yours. Just do what makes you feel good. Do what is right in your own eyes. And yet the Bible we read is all about conditional, unconditional love. It's about the kind of love that has nothing to do with what the recipient deserves, but has everything to do with what the giver, what the one who loves, commits themselves to. This is the gospel. The gospel is Jesus telling you and telling me that even when you did not deserve honor, Jesus honored you. That even when you did not deserve love, he loved you. That even when you did not deserve forgiveness, he forgave you. That when you did not deserve eternal life, he died for you so that you would have eternal life. While we were still sinners, God loved us. This is the message that I want to scream at the top of my lungs, that I want to share with everyone who has had a misconception about what church is, who has had a misconception about what religion is, about what Christianity is. I want to explain to them, church is not a place where God is telling you, don't do this, don't do that. If you do that, you're going to get a slap on the hand and I'm going to be angry at you and God has thunderbolts and he's going to throw it down at you and smite you. That is not the God that we serve. The God that we serve wants to teach you, wants to train you, wants to show you what unconditional love is. And that is what the Ten Commandments are. The Ten Commandments are showing us, are revealing to us what God means when he says, unconditionally love God one another. Unconditionally, no strings attached, no, no extra, you know, no end, license, end user agreement where you have to have all these different stipulations that if you do this and that, I will then love you, I will then care about you. God chooses his words very carefully. And when Jesus says that the whole laws, that the whole law and all the prophets can be distilled into one commandment of loving God and loving others, as I read the Ten Commandments, it's all about relationship. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's not about rules that you have to keep. It's about how do you love someone? How do you truly love someone? So we're going to read from Exodus chapter 20 starting from verse 12, and it's on the screen behind me. Exodus chapter 12, 20, starting from verse 12, and we're, we're going to just go through these six commands. But again, these commandments, it's, they are really wrapped in one. These next six are just one. Love, love each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse, verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother and your mother, that your days may be long in the land, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These these commandments, when I was a child being taught these things, I mean, our our children... um, you know, in our house, but also in the children's program, they recently went over the Ten Commandments. They learned these Ten Commandments. And I think it's great that they learned the Ten Commandments. But as a child, when I learned this, I really thought this was like the the rules, the rules that I had to live by, that I had to do. And I think the problem was 
is not that it shouldn't be taught. It absolutely should be taught. It is the Word of God. But the problem was I was so focused on obeying these commandments that I did not understand why God wanted me to obey these. God does not want you to obey the Ten Commandments simply to please Him, like simply just to make Him happy. It's not about that. He is happy when you keep these, but the benefit is not for Him. The benefit is for you. It is so that your life will be blessed. It's so that you will experience unconditional love. It's that you will be able to express unconditional love. God is trying to define what this unconditional love, in Hebrew it's this hesed, it's this uh, is giving love, it's this, it's this sacrificial love. He wants you to know what his love is like, and that's why he's given us the Ten Commandments. This is not for you to beat yourself up when you fail, it is so that you would look at God that when you do fail, you recognize your failures are not God's failures. We fail at loving unconditionally all the time. God never fails. When God wrote these Ten Commandments, when he spoke them, he never fails in any way. Jesus never failed in keeping any of these commandments, and yet we do. So I want to start with the first one. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother. God uses this word honor very specifically. See, he doesn't say obey your father and mother. He says honor your father and mother. There are times in the Bible, in Proverbs, it says, says, children, obey your parents. Even in the New Testament, it says, children, obey your parents. But in the Ten Commandments, it says, honor your father and mother, because it's not just for children. This is for anyone and everyone, regardless of how old you are or how young you are, you are called to experience unconditional love through honoring your parents. And again, honoring is not the same as obedience. And this is where I was a little bit confused when I was growing up because I thought honoring my parents meant that I would obey them. And yes, that is true for children. Children need to obey their parents in the way that they honor God. But now I'm an adult. Now I'm an adult. And so, I mean, just be, let's be real. And now as an adult, I don't have to call my dad every time I make a decision. I don't have to tell him, like, Dad, am I allowed um, to get you know, to get dinner tonight? Like, I I don't have to ask him, you know, can I stay out past midnight? I don't have to ask him these things because I'm no longer under his authority in that way. But even though I'm an adult and I have my own family, I'm still called to honor my father and honor my mother. So what does that mean? If it's not obedience, what does this honoring mean? And how does this have to do with unconditional love? I was thinking about this for more of a philosophical qu- a question or like a riddle, I guess, in, in many ways. How does a Christian honor their parents who are not Christian? How, how could, how could a, a son or a daughter who came to know Jesus honor their non-believing, their Buddhist, their Hindu, their Muslim, their, their atheist parents, even if they, don't be- if they don't believe the same thing? How can there be honor in that relationship? And I think it's come to a very simple and practical answer of what honoring really is. And, and, and this is, again, my interpretation of what it means to honor my parents, but this is where I've made the decision that I will never shame my parents publicly. I will never, I will never put their dirty laundry out to dry. I will never make it seem like my parents are these terrible people. I will speak highly of my parents. I will speak highly of my mother and father who raised me, who have given me their genetics, who I I have inherited. I have inherited their personalities, their abilities and all these things that even if they are the most terrible people, which they're not, but even if they do the most heinous things, which they don't, I won't shame them publicly. And and see, this is what unconditional love is, is that even if they deserve to be shamed, that honoring your father and mother is all about honoring your father and mother. I think of the story in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 9, Noah 
and his sons uh, have, have, have experienced the flood, and now they're on dry ground, and, and Noah plants a vineyard. And Noah plants a vineyard, and he, he, he makes wine. That's like the first thing he does. It's, it's very interesting how, how the Bible uh, kind of adds some humor. But he, he plants a vineyard, and he makes wine, and he gets drunk. And not only does he get drunk, he gets naked. And so he's just like, I mean, imagine Noah, the, the, the Noah that we, we, we all know about. He gets drunk and he gets naked, and it's in the Bible. Look at it, Genesis chapter 9. He gets drunk and naked, and he's just laying in his tent. He's just chilling. Like, he's, he's having a great time. And his son Ham, what a terrible name, but his son Ham, um, comes in and he sees his father drunk and naked. And he goes and tells his other brothers, Look at our idiot father. And he, and he makes it public. His dad's alone in his tent, drunk and naked, which isn't right. It's not good. God, I mean, it's clearly not good that he's naked and drunk. It's, it's bad. But he goes out and he makes it public. He airs out his dad's dirty laundry. And the other brothers do what good children do. They covered their father. And again, please feel free to read it. It's actually a beautiful story. I never really understood. Why did Ham get into so much trouble? Because Noah curses Ham right after this. And there's a, a curse on the lineage of Ham. And, and, and Shem and Japheth, they are blessed by Noah. But Ham is cursed. And I remember growing up thinking like, but doesn't Noah deserve to be like found out? Because he got drunk and naked. That's so shameful. Isn't it okay that Ham, like, tells people, like, what a drunk his dad is? But the heart of unconditional love, unconditional love, is what Shem and Japheth do. That they see their father in sin. And I'm going to call it sin. They see their father drunk and naked and shameful, and instead of condemning him, they cover him. They bring honor to him. We all have imperfect parents. I have imperfect parents. You have imperfect parents. And no matter what they've done, this commandment is telling you unconditionally, give them honor. And I know that's so hard. It's so difficult because there are these times where you are so angry at them, but you have to let your anger relent and follow the word of God. This is very difficult. This is very difficult, and I'm still working on this myself. The next commandment says, you shall not murder. And along the same lines, God is doing here something very important of laying the foundation of what unconditional love is. Jesus explains what this commandment means, and it's don't have hatred. Don't hate someone else. Don't hate. Don't hate because when you hate them, you are killing them. You are murdering them in your hearts. And you are guilty of this sin. And what I love about this now that I'm, I'm studying it and reading it and understanding it is that God is explaining what should already be understood is that it's not possible for you to love someone while you harbor hatred for them. It is impossible to have unconditional love to someone if you are hating them, even if your hatred is temporary. Unconditional love has no hatred in it whatsoever. Unconditional love does not desire someone's demise, it does not desire someone's end, it desires their life. This is very difficult again. I mean, obviously not the murder part. I hope none of you ever murder anyone. But I guarantee you, many of you have had hatred towards someone. I'm sure many of you have hated someone so deeply, so violently, so aggressively. And you have to realize that in that moment that you experience that hate, that you are not loving and that you need Jesus. All of these commands, what I love about them is that they show God's heart, but they also reveal our heart. They reveal our hearts to show how sinful and selfish we are, how much, how much we want to destroy what God is doing, 
When you hate someone and you, wanna, you want them to die, you want them to no longer exist, you are saying to God, God, you made a mistake. Even though you made this person in the image of God, they don't deserve life. And I wish they were dead. There is no love in that. And there has to be repentance. There has to be confession. We cannot call ourselves believers and followers of Christ if we harbor this kind of hatred. Jesus is not condemning you for having this hatred. He is inviting you. He's inviting you to let go. He's inviting you to understand God's unconditional heart. Because if you harbor hatred to someone else, what inevitably happens is that in your relationship with God, when you sin, you will begin to think, God hates me. I, I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've done this a lot of times. I'm a pastor, so I'm, I'm all about doing the right thing. I'm all about making sure that I follow the, the straight and narrow and make sure I do the right thing. And when I fail, when I fail, I feel like God doesn't like me because I've failed. What God is teaching in this of you shall not murder is even when you make mistakes, God will never murder you. God will never kill you because God is not that kind of God. You are that kind of person that has hatred in your heart that you want to kill people. If you had the power of God, you would probably kill a lot of people. But what the kind of love God has is even when you mess up, God will never murder you. So please don't convolute this passage to capital punishment or to war. They are very different things, and this is where it gets very controversial because people will say, God says you shall not murder, therefore we should always be against war. We should always be against any form of capital punishment because God himself says do not murder. Murder is about the heart. Is about hatred being in the heart and wanting someone to die because you hate them. And this is where some wars are injustice. Some wars are unjust because the wars are fueled by hatred of people. But wars are just when it's about defending what is good and what is right. Capital punishment, not just in our day and age, and I'm not trying to get political in any way, but in the time of Moses, there was capital punishment that was taught to the people. And it wasn't out of hatred to the criminal. It was simply justice that was to be done. That wasn't considered murder because they knew the rules. They knew the consequences of their actions. And there are consequences to your actions and my actions. But that is not what this is talking about. This kind of murder... The murder that is talked about here is when it's done in hatred. And that is devoid of love. The next one is you shall not commit adultery. And man, this is such a deep one. And I hope you understand every single one of these commandments I could do a whole series on. It's not like I can just, I'm, I'm just distilling it as quickly as possible for you to understand. But this one especially, I could do a three-month series on you shall not commit adultery. And why this has to do with unconditional love. See, adultery is a, a very interesting thing. Adultery is one where it's about... I mean, let's just be real. And again, uh, the, thankfully the youth kids are all gone and, and all that stuff, but it's about sleeping around. It's about being married or, or sleeping with a married person or being married or not even being married and just sleeping with a bunch of people and engaging in sexual acts with people and, and engaging in this lustful desire and feeding that lust. And Jesus even explains that when you look at a woman, when you look at someone with lustful intentions, with these lustful eyes, you are committing adultery in your heart. Jesus was very interested in getting into the heart, the heart of these commands, these heart of these commandments. And the problem is in our day and age, in our day and age, we have been told by the secular world, by our humanistic, naturalistic tendencies, that it's okay. It's okay if you sleep around. It's okay if you slept with a bunch of people. There are going to be no negative repercussions. It's natural. It's good. Do what you want. Find who you want to be with so that they make you happy. They make you feel good. 
And it's not just physical, it's also emotional. This kind of adultery is not just in the physical form, it's in the emotional form. It's done in many ways. And the problem, the problem with the way that we consume our media, the way we consume the things of this world, is that we begin to normalize adultery, and yet we experience the backlash of adultery. So what do I mean by this? And I know this is it's kind of a funny example, but truly, I, I'm actually being really serious, is that there should be no surprise to anyone that Tinder exists. There should be no surprise that dating apps exist. And not that you can't find the love of your life on a dating app. I, know, I actually know many people that met their spouse on a dating app. But the reason why it should be to no surprise that these dating apps exist is because it is inherently feeding in to this idea of adultery. And not just that it's a, a hookup app that you can find someone to sleep with. It's this idea that finding someone to love is about what they can give to me. Adultery is all about what this person can give to me rather than what I can sacrifice to them. Adultery is all about a person, someone else, meeting my needs in a way that God can't. And I'm going to say God because whether you're single or whether you're married, you can commit adultery. If you're single, you can commit adultery by saying, God, you can't meet my needs, my physical needs, you can't meet my spiritual needs, you can't meet my emotional needs, so I have to sleep with this person. I have to, I'm led to, because they will feed my needs. This is a very conditional type of love. I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, this idea of adultery, and I do not mean to make this gender specific. Um, it, really, both, it applies to both genders, but I'm going to speak kind of gendered a little bit, but a lot of times for men, but a lot of times for men, they want to find a pretty girl. And again, this is, does not mean that women do not want a pretty guy. I'm, I'm, I guarantee you a lot of you women would love a hunk, like would love a very good-looking, masculine, like strong dude. But you know what? A lot of times it's the, it's the guys that are addicted to pornography, that they go to strip clubs, they do these things, and, and it's, it's just more common in that way. Not trying to make generalities in that whatsoever. But what ends up happening is this. Because of the lustful eyes and this heart of adultery, unconditional love is out the door. And it all becomes conditional. And without even knowing it, the culture does it where all of a sudden the wives and women and little girls, like young ones, even like my daughter, begin to think, in order for me to be valuable, I need to be pretty. Because if I'm pretty, then a boy will like me. Then someone will desire me if I look good. And we perpetuate this lie because of our lustful eyes, because of our lustful intentions. We not only commit adultery, and again, it's not about the rules. The heart of the rule is that it begins to destroy the psyche of these young women. Of these young women that begin to think the only way I'm going to find a husband is if I lose 10 more pounds is if I wear the right makeup, if I have the best clothes, that that is the only way I will find the love of my life. How terrible is that? How conditional is that? Yet the world perpetuates it. The world perpetuates it when men sleep around with all these women and they have these one-night stands and they go and they sleep around that women follow suit and they sleep around and all of a sudden you have all these people that are just having a lot of sex and it feels good, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a lot of fun. It's really great. But once the next morning comes and there's no relationship, there's nothing unconditional about it. It is simply on the condition that, hey, you were hot last night, but now I'm, I'm, it's in the morning and I'm sober. You can get out. <laughs> you can leave. And we wonder why, we wonder why our relationships are so, are so weak, are so brittle. Why we feel like when we get older, we feel like we're not pretty enough, we're not good enough, that we don't, we need to go to the gym more, we need to make sure that we look good, that we, we buy the purses and the dresses and all those things that, that is taught that you need to have this conditional attractiveness. And it goes the other way around with men. 
Again, not to be gendered, but again, if you're an unemployed dude compared to an employed dude, if you're a guy that makes six figures, or if you're a guy that makes seven figures, oh, all of a sudden all the girls are starting to call. Everyone wants that kind of security, that kind of stability, because if you make seven figures, if you make six figures, all of a sudden you become on top of the totem pole for the kind of eligible bachelor that there is. Conditional love is adultery. Or to put it better, adultery feeds conditional love. It teaches you, it teaches you look for something better. And I think in both cases, the emotional adultery is very interesting. When you find your spouse not able to meet your, your emotional needs, when your spouse is no longer fun to be with, when your spouse is no longer understanding or kind, when they no longer meet the conditions that you have for a spouse, you try to go find someone else who does. Find someone who does listen. Find someone who is understanding. Find someone who is patient. Find someone who meets your conditions and live with them and be with them. Unconditional love says, even if my spouse isn't understanding, I still love them. I still care about them. Unconditional love is looking at them and saying, even if, and, 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 this, and this sounds terrible, but even if you're not attractive to me, I'm still committed to you. Even if I, I, I don't have the same butterflies in my stomach, I'm going to be with you forever and ever. And the blessing that God has for that kind of love and commitment is that you learn to love. God begins to spark up that relationship again because you've made that commitment to be unconditionally loving. The next one kind of goes along with the last one. It says, you shall not steal. And this should seem very black and white. Do not steal. But how can stealing be loving? That's all I have to ask. How can stealing be loving? I remember when I was a kid, I remember we were at, it was at a gas station or something, and I was a kid and I took a, a pack of Bubblicious. It was the watermelon flavor of Bubblicious. And I was a, I was a little kid. Like I, was, I was probably like my daughter's age, like four. And I took a pack of Bubblicious, I put it in my pocket, and I, I knew well enough just to, to go home in my room and eat it like, while I'm alone and no one can see my shame. Uh, but I'm eating the Bubblicious. And it seems so like, oh, stealing, you know, yeah, yeah, it's bad, but, you know, it's like, whatever, what a big deal. As long as you're not doing a lot, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, kind, of, kind of thinking about that again, even as a child, stealing a pack of Bubblicious, you're stealing, you're stealing someone's wages. You're stealing from their ability to provide for their family. You know, I think of, I think of the, the people working at the gas stations. You know, like, uh, the, the, they're the ones that are, are working really hard, and you're, and you're taking away from them what they earned, what they had, have worked for, and you are making it harder on them. I mean, yeah, it may be a couple cents. It may be, like, less than a dollar, but yet you are still taking away what they deserve. There is no justice in that. That is an injustice. And it can't be loving. I remember when I was a youth pastor... I would play basketball with my kids. And, and for whatever reason, I carried around a lot of cash um, because like when we go to youth events, I, 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 sometimes I, they, they would only take cash and so I, I would pay, and I, I was a big youth group and I would pay for it. But I remember it was, it was very interesting. Um, we would play basketball and, and while we were playing basketball, someone went into my bag and stole $120 from my wallet. And I was a poor youth pastor. <laughs> and I, I knew it was one of my youth students. I knew it was one of my youth students that stole from me, and it, and it not just, it didn't make me angry. I wasn't like, oh my God, my life is over, but I was poor, and it was like, you stole from me money that I'm using for ministry, and like, I, I remember like telling my youth group next day, because I never found out who did it. I, I had suspicion, like, like I, I had a suspect in mind, but I was never going to like confront them, but I basically like, told the youth group, I was like, y'all hurt me. Like, that hurt. Like, if you needed money from me, I would have given it to you gladly. But the fact that you stole it from me hurt. I'm just trying to explain to you that the Ten Commandments are all about relationship. The next commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And without getting into too much detail, um, there's a, a specific angle I want to take on this that you just kind of need to buckle your seatbelts a little bit. Like, I, I was taught you sh when you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, I thought it just meant don't lie. Like, don't ever lie. Um, lying is bad. 
I'm not saying lying isn't, isn't bad. Lying is bad. Like lying is not good. Being dishonest is bad. But this is actually very specific wording. Do not, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not say something untrue about your neighbor. That's, I mean, that's essentially what it means. And I think there is a sin that we have committed time and time again that is incredibly unloving in regards to bearing false witness against our neighbors. And that has to do with racism. As an Asian American living in Denver, it's incredibly Caucasian in, in Denver. And what I hate, and I've learned, I've learned to just be so sensitive to it, and I, I don't like that I'm sensitive to it, but what I don't like is when someone begins to make judgments on me because of how I look. They bear false witness. In my opinion, again, this is why I, I'm saying buckle your seatbelts because I think it's absolutely wrong, but it's interesting to me now that the coronavirus is in China, and, uh, and again, it sounds silly, but it's kind of in my head, I feel bad for some Chinese restaurants. I feel bad for some businesses that are owned by, by people that are Asian. And, and I, I think about it, and now people are like, should we even have the Olympics in Tokyo? Because aren't they all the same? And, and for me, it's like, how much more do you misunderstand that I am not who you say I am? You're bearing false witness against me. You're saying something that is just not true about me. And again, yes, I'm Asian, but this happens far too often with our African-American, our black friends, our black brother and sisters who are looked at, who are looked at with such prejudice, with so much racism, and without even knowing who they are, without even saying hello and getting to know their name and getting to know their story, their life, or, or, or who they are even like, we bear false witness against them. Oh, they must be in a gang. Oh, they must, they must be into drugs. They must be doing bad things. And, and you know what? They're probably not safe to be around my children because, because of how they look. The last one, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is an important one for our church because many times when there's wealth, there is this jealous attitude that comes to wealth. Oh, this person, you know, they drive such a nice car or they have such a big house. And, and I think as pastors, there are a lot of times that this happens even to us. You know, my, my sister's a doctor, <laughs> and, and, and she's, a, she's a very, you know, well-to-do doctor. And so it's like, I'm this lowly pastor, and she's a doctor. And there are these times where I'm like, yo, you just have it better off than I do. What I've learned about covetousness, that it's not about jealousy. It is about a heart that is unloving. It is about looking at someone and saying, because you have a lot, I don't want relationship with you. Because you have a lot, you need to give up what you have in order for me to be your friend. If you want to be my friend, then you can't. You can't have a nice house. If you want to be my friend, you can't have nice things because I'm going to covet those things. I'm going to want those things. I'm going to desire those things. And so you know what? It's better for me just to break off relationship with you all together. The command is to not covet, not to break relationship. It's that you would look deep in your heart and understand that God is going to provide for you and God has given you the lot that you need, that he's a good father unto you. Again, I can go into each and every one of these. And I think maybe it was a mistake for me to just make it into a two-week a two series over the Ten Commandments. One of these days, I promise you, we'll go back to the Ten Commandments in, in depth. There's so much wisdom when it comes to the Ten Commandments. But I, wanna, I really want to leave you, I wanna leave you today with the, just a nugget of wisdom. Like truly, like I, I, just, I just need you to understand this. What it means to be a Christian is not that you're a rule follower. It's that you're a lover. What it means to be a Christian is not that you are a good person. It's that you are a loving person. What it means to follow the Ten Commandments isn't that you don't murder, you don't lust, you don't do these bad things. What it means is, is that no matter who you interact with, that you care for them, that you love them deeply. That doesn't matter what their background is, matter what they've done, that you want to show them the love of Christ in all things. And it's going to be hard. And you're going to fail. And that's why Jesus came to die for you. The Ten Commandments, less of being rules, for me, 
And I hope for you, it becomes a test, a way to test your heart, and a way for you to be led into repentance. A lot of times when I, when I say, hey, let's go into a time of repentance, a lot of you are like, I don't know what to repent for. The Ten Commandments is an easy way to get into repentance. Because you know what? There are times where you're going to read, honor your father and mother, and you're going you're gonna to be convicted. I don't do that. So repent. It's not that God hates you. It's that God wants you to turn from your wicked ways. There are going to be times where you have hatred in your heart to someone, that you want them to die. It's a time to repent. There are times where you're going to covet someone. You're going to covet someone's car, someone's house. You're going to covet someone's wife, someone's husband. It's a time to repent and go to Jesus and say, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, strengthen me. Help me to be like you. See, that's the best place to be as a Christian. You're not called to be perfect. You're not called to be perfect. You're called to be like the one who is perfect. You're called to call on him, ask for his power, and he will send you the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this congregation. And Lord, again, oh man, I love your word, and I pray that we would not just stop today at reading your word and, and going into what the Ten Commandments even mean, but I pray you would make us a loving church. You would make us a church that, ah, oh, God, that just is, is so like your son, that is not judgmental, that is not harsh, that we are kind and gentle. But Lord, we need help. I need help. We fail this every single day. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to follow your commands and to love one another and to love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your kindness, your goodness. Jesus, it's all about you. Lord, we fail these Ten Commandments all the time. Lord, I fail these Ten Commandments this week. I fail these Ten Commandments today. And yet you still love me because your love is unconditional. That no matter how much I make mistakes, you still love me and desire relationship for me. Teach me how to do the same. Teach me how to be the same with those around me in all things. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.